Welcome everyone, I'm Spiro, thanks for tuning in. Before we get started today, YouTube removed my latest report on mandatory vaccines being authorized in my state under the emergency declaration. The video is still available on BitChute and I urge all of you to go and watch this report right after you watch this one. I'll leave a link in the uh, description of this video. Now today, I'm very happy to have a, a special guest who is a leading and critical expert on sustainable development, green economy, Agenda 21, the 2030 Agenda, and historic technocracy. He is the author of Technocracy, The Hard Road to World Order, and Technocracy Rising, The Trojan Horse of Global Transformation. He also co-authored The Trilaterals Over Washington, Volumes 1 and 2, with the late Anthony C. Sutton. Patrick Wood is a leading expert on elitist trilateral commission, their policies and achievements in creating their self-proclaimed new international economic order, which is the essence of sustainable development on a global scale. Mr. Wood is an economist by education and a fin financial analyst and a writer by profession and an American constitutionalist by choice. He is also the editor chief and founder of technocracy.news. Patrick Wood, welcome and thank you for being my guest today. Great, Spiro. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. This is great. I've been looking forward to talking to you. Likewise. And I, I can't wait to get right into this. And so right out of the gate, I just want to get go right to the root of things. Like right now, what is your take uh, on the big picture perspective? What is taking place right now and what is the agenda? Well, I've been writing about technocracy and speaking about it for a number of years now, as you know, and about globalization in general for decades. The thing that I talk about most is technocracy right now, because I believe that is and has been the major uh, thread of history leading up to where we are today. And I do believe, starting with this great panic of 2020 that I call it, not just the pandemic, but the great panic of 2020, um, we have essentially a technocrat coup d'etat that's happened, not just in our country, <clears throat> it's the whole world. And the, the seriousness of this, of this whole thing is just so immense that it's hard to get your head wrapped around it. And I'm sure some people are going to be watching this thinking, what are they talking about? How could this possibly be? But the whole world right now is laboring under the same issues that we are laboring in our country. That is the great panic of 2020. And aside from the, the physical virus part of it, we just kind of put that aside for a bit. <clears throat> the reaction to it and the control mechanisms that have been set in place since then indicates to me that the technocrats who were pushing technocracy globally have finally succeeded in springing the trap on the entire planet. And in the process, they've shut down the entire economic, global economic system. And um, but we'll talk about that a little bit. This This is... This is so big, it is hard to get your head wrapped around it. And I, I sometimes assume that people know more than what they do because I've been studying this for so long, looking at it for so long, it just seems natural to me. So I really want people to understand this and get a, get a, a grasp of what's going on globally because it does affect us. And I can assure you from emails I get from around the world, people in other countries are looking to America again to save the world, oh, God help us. <laughs> it's a, and it's not gonna be our government that does it, it's the American citizens like you and me. Somehow, we have to come up with something that's gonna throw a monkey wrench in this whole thing and reject technocracy again once and for all. It was rejected back in the last century in the 40s and late 30s and 40s. We need to reject it again and knock it back into the last century and leave it there permanently. And it once you really uh, understand it, it it blows my mind how it's all encompassing. Every aspect of our lives, uh, they have already have a plan for, and and we're gonna get into that more here in a little bit. But um, you know, as you clearly stated, and and I, you know, mentioned in your bio and in with your books and everything, you are a leading expert on technocracy, no doubt about it. And I've been following your work for years. Uh, how would you best describe to someone who's not familiar with the term? Uh, technocracy or, or a technocrat, how would you best describe like what is a technocrat? Who is a technocrat? Right. I always lead that, que uh, that to answer that question with a statement from technocracy itself. The, this was a movement that started back in the 1930s originally. <clears throat> they defined themselves. I don't need to rehash their own definition because it's still true today as it was back then. They said back then in 1938, for instance, in the 
magazine they published called The Technocrat. They said, technocracy is the science of social engineering. That's the first big tell here, the science of social engineering. It's the scientific operation of the entire social mechanism to produce and distribute goods and services to the entire population. That's the economic flavor of this whole thing. It was not a political system. They hated politicians. They wanted to do away with the entire political structure and simply manage the economy where people live. That's where people do stuff, right? <clears throat> and they wanted to do it using what they call the science of social engineering. And anywhere you see somebody practicing social engineering, you're touching the heart of a technocrat. And I spent a lot of time over the years that talked about a lot about the mind of a technocrat. And I've always wanted to get in their head, not to become one, but I want to know how they think. I want to know why they think what they think. I want to understand the subtleties of what they're likely to think about some other situation that might come up. <clears throat> and it's not too difficult to peg a lot of people as a technocrat. For instance, you look at an Anthony Fauci, for instance, pure example of somebody who's involved in the science of social engineering. It's not about the virus, it's about social engineering. He can fold his arms and look down his nose as he stands behind the president of our country, <laughs> and, he can, and he can look very condescending very quickly. And there's so many people like that, you know, the scientists in white coats and or engineers, whatever, and you know they're standing behind the scenes saying, we have the answer here, we have the only answer. You don't have anything, but you have to listen to us. And science says you should do X, Y, and Z, therefore you need to do X, Y, and Z, or you are gonna get punished somehow. And um, this is the mind of a technocrat. They're, they're all over the place. Al Gore is a good example of a technocrat. Some of the older people that were, remember back to Vietnam, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, who, uh, who prosecuted the Vietnam War, was a technocrat. And history books now even acknowledge this. This is the way he thought. He wanted to use the science of social engineering to prosecute a war. Didn't work out very well, did it? Mm, yeah. So we, we can look back through history and see a lot of examples. Um, you can look at Bill Gates right now. Bill Gates is the classic example of a technocrat mind. You can look at an Elon Musk. You can look at a Eric Schmidt, uh, ex-CEO of Google. You can look at a Jeff Bezos. These people are not communists. They're not socialists and they're not Marxists. They're technocrats. They think that way. So I hope that kind of scratches the surface on answering the question. I think so. And it's really important to understand that the social engineers are the ones trying to shape our perception of reality. So trying to understand, uh, get into the mind as any good investigator would do is, is really important because you can guarantee that they have been gathering every piece of information and data about you and, and the, the collective, the, everybody that they can to, so yes. that, so they can, uh, It'll help with them to uh, reshape society in how, the image that they see fit, and, and they make these decisions for us. It's not we don't have a say in this. Doesn't matter if you're a taxpayer or not. So this is an incredible, uh, incredibly important right now because we have seen their agenda go into high gear ever since you said uh, 2020, the the great uh, uh, pandemic. But it's also how did you refer to it? The Great Panic of 2020. The Great Panic of 2020. Now, going back to 1961, President Eisenhower gave his farewell speech, and he famously warned about the military-industrial complex. I think many of us have seen and heard, heard that video, that clip, but he also warned of the danger that the public policy could itself become captive of a scientific technological uh, elite. And to me, that sounds like he is warning us about the technocrats, uh, what is your take on Eisenhower's speech and what stage of the game are we in right now in the technocratic agenda? I want to say bingo. Um, and, and there were a lot of things, by the way, about Eisenhower that probably could be pretty critical of him just in kind of the whole scheme of, you know, presidents that come and go in history. But his farewell speech just kind of dropped that out, kind of like a little teaser. <laughs> I use that that actual statement from his video or audio uh, in my podcast, in the introduction to it, because it just fits. <clears throat> he understood technocracy. He was from that era, he grew up in that era. He knew exactly what he's talking about. And the scientific elite that was rising up at that point 
was a great threat in his mind, was a threat to the political system. And I think that's why he said that. He was a master politician, a really just in, in an impeccable sense. He played every possible political card that he could to get where he got. So if he understood technocracy as being a threat to the political structure, that would have alarmed him. And I think it did. I think that's why he said that. Yeah, it's. I think so. And and he seemed, I mean, he was on his way out. He had nothing uh, to gain from saying that at that point in time. In fact, he had a lot of things to lose because he was outing uh, another very powerful group that operates behind the scenes that, you know, he warned could take over uh, society, essentially, and, and the public would be none the wiser. They, they wouldn't really realize that it had happened, you know, uh, to a large degree. And it, you know, it seems throughout this... Uh, this long-standing agenda that has been around since the 30s, as you pointed out, uh, it's really beginning to take shape right now as the technology <clears throat> has you know, caught up to the vision uh, of technocracy and control and uh, you know, allowing the technocrats to really fully implement their scientific dictatorship, uh, which is accelerating, in my view, uh, due to this, this coronavirus pandemic. Now, how do you see this playing out, Patrick Wood, uh, as 5G and the Internet of Things rolls out and the central banks are getting ready to roll out their digital currencies and the digital IDs? I mean, everything is coming together. And very soon, in the very near future, we're going to have this brand new experimental vaccine arriving. And how, how do you see these things unfolding and coming together? I can I can assure you, like, like a good magician, I'm not a magician. But if I was going to play a trick, I would do something over here while you never saw the trick, <laughs> right? So any distraction that comes along, like BLM riots and Antifa riots and so on like that, you know, these become a, just a huge distraction. And people look, oh, whoa, look over here, what's happening? It's so outrageous. Meanwhile, back over here on the other side, the real trick is taking place and technocracy marches on. The, the technocracy... Uh, tech, Technology back in the day, uh, 1932, 1934, didn't exist to do what we can do today, but they knew it was coming. There's, I've studied this and done a lot of original research and into original documents from that era <clears throat> to come to believe that they had a full understanding of, of the trajectory that technology was going to take. Part of the reason I believe that is because when they actually formulated the organization or the, the, the philosophy, um, the economic system, they were at Columbia University in the basement of Hamilton Hall. That's it's the only building at the time. But they had half the basement of Hamilton Hall dedicated to them, uh, it was pro bono, um, <clears throat> to work on this new economic system. And many of the engineers and scientists from Columbia were participating in that project. In the other half of the basement was the early iteration of IBM those brainiacs that uh, that created the first tabulator built it in the bottom of Hamilton Hall. And so they rubbed shoulders with these guys. These were visionaries. All of them were visionaries. They were the progressives of that day, the scientific progressives who saw where technology and computation and so on was going to go. And so when, techno when te technocracy was formulated or codified, let's say, they drew on everything they knew about data and about computation and about things that could be done to track things and uh, <clears throat> to catalog things. And of course, that was what the first tabulator was all about. It was mostly, well, it was punch cards and it was uh, able to do massive amounts of statistical analysis that the world had never seen before. And um, <clears throat> this was all the stuff they, they cooked into their system. Now the technology has caught up. Now they're able to do the things they only dreamed about back in 1932 plus. And it's coming back to bite us in ways that the world was not prepared to understand at all because it's the whole concept of technocracy has been submerged, as you know. And the names have been changed along the way for marketing purposes. It's now mostly uh, promoted as sustainable development, which is United Nations program. Um, Again, an economic system. It's not a political system. It's an economic system. And these people back in the early day, they hated politicians with a passion. And they wanted, um, in fact, they called on Roosevelt, who was just coming in in 1933, to declare himself dictator, dismiss all of the politicians to Washington, D.C., and simply implement technocracy. That's what they wanted. 
glad he didn't take him up on it. <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation today. But, um, you know, here we are. And now these people are coming back as a group to reassert themselves on society, taking control of society to create a scientific dictatorship. And that's exactly where we're going. And, you know, speaking of the United Nations, we hear them often talking about bioethics and even biodiversity. And you've been talking about bioethics over on your channel. And can you please explain the significance behind this? And, you know, how does population control slash eugenics fit into this agenda on a greater scale? The, the, the concept of bioethics, I realize, is really difficult for a lot of people to understand until, they, until it really kind of bites them directly. It has to do with the ethics of the treatment of your body of your biological condition. And you say, well, why is that an issue? I'll, I'll give you a personal story of why it's an issue with me. My, uh, my mother uh, grew up, she was born, I think in 1924, something like that. And she grew up uh, up in Northern California in a day when the eugenics movement was just going crazy. Mostly centered at Berkeley, by the way, University of Cal Berkeley. <clears throat> and the, all of the, the upper crust of people in the Bay Area um, we're all in eugenics, and uh, there was a lot of stuff going on that would just amaze you today, like uh, forced sterilization, for instance. If, uh, if somebody believed that their germline, their gene line was defective somehow, that they would produce people that didn't measure up for society, why, they should be sterilized. And if they didn't want to be sterilized, they should be sterilized anyway. You know, what the heck? So... <clears throat> My, uh, my grandmother, who was all into that sort of stuff, she believed those people at Berkeley. Um, she had a son, uh, firstborn, who was, um, as it turns out, mentally retarded and had a, a developed about six, you know, sixth grade, something like that, maybe, I don't know, less than that, actually. But um, then, he, then she had a daughter, and that would have been his younger sister. <clears throat> well, they believed that the son was genetically uh, bad. <laughs> Therefore, they reason that it probably will skip a generation, which means that my mother didn't have it, but my mother probably would have children that would be like him. So they said, you need to take your daughter down and get her sterilized. And they did. They took her down, basically screaming and kicking to a hospital in the Bay Area, put her on a table, and they cut her fallopian tubes, and she was sterilized for life. She wasn't very pleased about that. You can imagine, that's not the thing that you expect your mother to do to you. And years later, uh, another doctor uh, examined um, this, this guy, her older brother, and determined he wasn't genetically retarded at all. But when he was born, the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck and he su suffered oxygen deprivation, okay? Well, <clears throat> anyway, my mother could never have children. She got married. She was still very angry about not being able to have, have children. And that was just after the war. And a boat came over from Holland, uh, where my birth mother was uh, pregnant all the way over on the ship. Gave birth immediately coming off the ship and gave me up for adoption. And I happened to be adopted into this family who's, who my mother, my adoptive mother, was forcibly sterilized by the eugenics program, these nutcakes in Northern California. And you know that program was not disbanded until the mid 1960s. I was like, you, you would think after Hitler and after World War II that they would have just said, guys, you're all under arrest or something and just shut it down. They didn't. And it took all that time for activists to get it shut down in California. And there's some other states, too, that had eugenics program like that. This is the insanity of eugenics. And that, remember, I, the reason I tell a story is that was back in the day in 1932. In that era, just right out, maybe it's the late 30s that my mother was sterilized. That was right when technocracy was in its A day. The, and these people didn't write about it, but they wrote about the human condition they wrote about the science of social engineering and the bioethics of that included your body and what they would do to you. But just And my takeaway after reading all their early literature, and I still see this at the United Nations today, and I still see it when Bill Gates speaks anywhere, they look at you and I as a couple of cattle, steers, in a giant feedlot where 
all of your food is pre-mixed and you're force fed and you get shots with this thing and that thing and you get branded and you get pushed to this corral and pushed to that corral. And this is social engineering in their mind. This is why it's just absolutely so deadly today. You look at the bioethics movement right now, this is just a continuation of what's been going on for almost a hundred years. These people have not changed. And they still look at people and say, it doesn't matter. I mean, you lose a few, you know, you got to lose, you know, you break a few eggs to make an omelet. They apparently just don't really care about individual human life. To me, that's astounding. It's evil. It's anti-human, isn't it? That <laughs> really is anti-human. In fact, there was a book written on that a few years ago by a, a bioethicist who was on the good side who wrote a book about the the anti-human aspect of all of these things that we're talking about. It's incredible. Yes, it is uh, anti-human and dehumanizing. And, and uh, what an incredible story and a personal story. Thank you for sharing that uh, with us. I mean, it's unbelievable uh, to think California here in the U.S. I mean, that really wasn't that long ago. And then when you're talking about them uh, having to dismantle these programs and, you know, a lot of there, it's like you pointed out, it's still happening today. Essentially, they just took the programs and went underground or rebranded them, renamed them. And, you know, and, and so, you know, these people uh, who are eugenicists, they hold themselves to be at a, a higher standard than the rest of us who you describe. They will see us as the useless eaters and the cattle <clears throat> to be uh, experimented upon and, and, and whatever as they see fit. Uh, so, yes, this this is the agenda of the social engineers on its face value. I mean, this is what's taking place right now. And, um, you know, it's it's just amazing to see this rolling out. And, and it certainly appears, in my view, that we're marching towards global governance. And it could be argued that, you know, we already have global governance in some forms. Uh, but I want to get back to what role the United Nations plays in this agenda, because I believe it's a big one and it's an important one. And, uh, you know, what does the fate of the U.S. look like? You know, how could there be a global governance system if the U.S. and the Constitution is still around, you know, giving us our sovereignty? Yeah, well, obviously it can't. Um, the Constitution in our country and our uh, freedom-loving people um, have been under attack for a long time. It's not that won't surprise anybody. The coup d'état will surprise everybody today that they're finally bringing the hammer down. Uh, but we've been under, we've been on the slate for attack for a very long time, and I, I don't think anybody would uh, would say no, that's not true. We have been. The rest of the world uh, has already pretty much fallen prey to this whole scenario. And <clears throat> it's important to remember that technocracy is not a political system. It's an economic system. And I, I know that's a little bit difficult to understand because you grew up with, uh, with an, an economic system around us. We know it as free market economics, capitalism, free enterprise, things like that, uh, supply and demand, price-based, you know, money, currency, and all those sorts of things. We grew up with this, and this is all we know. They have something otherworldly in mind as an economic system. They believe that if they control all of the economic fr framework of the world and all the inputs and outputs, there's no need for, any, for a political system. There's no need for a, uh, a system of governance, if you will. There's no need for political leaders, if you will. This has led some global scholars like Prag Khanna, uh, professor down at the U School in uh, public policy in uh, Singapore, to uh, make a major conclusion in one of his books actually called Connectography, that the system is globalization or vice versa, globalization is the system. It's not, they're not making it for a dictator, they're making it as a system. The algorithm will run everything. You don't need political people to tell you, should you go here, should you go there, you know, do this, do that. The algorithm will put you in a channel, and if you vary, if you go too far left or right, pow, you know, you're going to get a shock or something. And people say, well, that's incredible, but <laughs> look at China, look at the social credit scoring system over there right now. And if you don't understand it, you better, because that's the kind of control by algorithm that these people are talking about. You don't need to be governed in a sense. It doesn't matter who's above you. It doesn't, they can call themselves anything they want. They could say they're 
national socialists. They could say that they're mar hardcore Marxist. It doesn't matter what they call themselves at the top. The people on the bottom are not being controlled by those tyrants directly. They're being controlled by algorithm. You get a ticket for jaywalking in China, you'll have the ticket deducted from your checking account or your bank account before you get back to your apartment because facial recognition watches you and identifies you as you walk across the street. The fine is calculated based on how many other times you might've done it or other things that you have. And they just go ahead, you're guilty, we've got you on tape, bang. You know, there's 50 yuan or something coming out of your bank account. And by the way, your social credit score just went down 100 points. <laughs> and oh, you get a notice in a few days that you have to move out of the apartment that you're in because you're not qualified for that apartment anymore. Your social credit score is too low. They go, oh no, where am I gonna live? And then you get a notice, you can't go to that school. You can, you're, you're kicked out of the school you're in because you know, that school's reserved for good little citizens that don't jaywalk. Yeah, you get, my, you get the picture. This is not, it doesn't matter whether there's a committee anywhere. There aren't any committees, really. Once the algorithm's in place, it's push the button or, you know, click run program, and there you go, and it happens. And it's truly, uh, I mean, Orwellian doesn't even begin to describe it, but, uh, you know, this is apparent. This is the direction it's going. This is as the 5G is being rolled out and the smart cities and the artificial intelligence, which are going to be running this this grid that we're all going to be a part of. We're all going to be tied into with our digital identifications and our immunity passports and our, our finances, our medical transportation. Every aspect of this is, is heading towards this global, global uh, grid that we're all going to be a part of. And so... You know, when I had seen personally uh, the World Economic Forum announce the Great Reset and how it's tied into the Fourth Industrial Revolution, you know, I mean, this through the research of like yours and, and the work that you've done and, and others, and, you know, I we have already had an idea, we've already known where this is going. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see where this is going, but to actually hear uh, Klaus Schwab and, and these others saying it, you know, coming out of their own mouth, it was pretty astonishing uh, for me. What was your take when you when the World Economic Forum rolled out their announcement with the Great Reset? Yeah, I, I wasn't surprised in the slightest, and I'll tell you why. I, I was, well, what do I want to say? I was saddened to see it happen, I mean, to see him say that in a way, because like, okay, it's coup d'etat time. But going back to 1973, when the Trilateral Commission was founded, this is what they put in motion when they said they will create a new international economic order. They didn't say they were going to create a government order. They were going to create a new international economic order. And they called it that. It was all over their literature. And lo and behold, in 1974, the United Nations passed a resolution to create the new international economic order. Whoa. Okay. It just so happened that the Rockefeller people that started the Trilateral Commission had a great relationship with the UN forever. And they fed it to the UN and the next year that they came into being. This new international economic order was not understood by anybody back then, including myself and Anthony Sutton. We just didn't get it. We knew that it was a big deal. We knew that, that globalization was upon us, but we didn't fully understand it meant technocracy. There was no view of technocracy back in our minds in that day. If, we, if there had been, we would have pegged it right then, I'm certain. But this was what they had in mind. And all of these global elitists that, that were in the Trilateral Commission, they basically took over the industrialized world political system. Certainly in America they did with Jimmy Carter. It wasn't that they wanted political power. And I've demonstrated this in my books and my papers and so on ever since. What they were after was control over the economic engine of the world, which was clearly represented by the United States at that time. We were the big kingpins. And so eight out of 10, for instance, of the World Bank directors after that time were all members of the Trilateral Commission. Lo and behold, the World Bank, well, the president of the United States appoints the World Bank president. That's the way it is. And you had the same thing with the U.S. trade representative, something like nine out of 12 of subsequent U.S. trade representatives that have written all these cockeyed treaties since 1933, they were members of the Trilateral Commission. It wasn't about getting the presidency. It wasn't about getting the EPA or some other agency under the control. 
They wanted control of the global economic system so that they could create a new international economic order. What I'm documenting in my work today is they had in mind back then and forevermore have had in mind technocracy. This was the economic system that they were after. It's the only economic system, by the way, in the course of all of history that has been an alternative economic system to free enterprise. That has always been the type of economic system the world has labored under. Technocracy is new, it's otherworldly. And they, once they saw the possibilities of what it could do for them, they began to put it all into play. And one of the very first things they did, by the way, Zbigniew Brzezinski, a co-founder of the Trilateral Commission and worked for Jimmy Carter, he called up Chairman Deng in China and said, come on over, Chairman. We're going to have a nice little get together and we're going to bring you back into the global economic stage. And they taught China, not capitalism. They taught China, not free enterprise. They taught China technocracy. And that's why China is where it is today. And it's been identified by the global elite, by the way, as a technocracy. I, not my words. I, don't, I didn't make that analysis. The global elite themselves have said it. So now Klaus Schwab comes out and says, it's time for the big reset. And I'm thinking, okay, we knew it was coming, Klaus. We knew that you were behind it. You were part of the, that, that big clique, the global elite clique. You're just telling us what we should have already known. And I dare say, if my co-author Anthony Sutton were alive today, people have asked me this, what do you think Sutton would say? <laughs> He would get up on a stage and he'd, he'd have, he wasn't a man of a lot of words, by the way. He's, he's really an academic. He'd get up on a stage and he'd say about five words, maybe just four. He would say, I told you so. And he'd walk off the stage. <laughs> the, yes, I mean, the, the timing, yes, absolutely right. I mean, when this this falls into the problem reaction solution hegelian dialectic to a t i mean with this this whole crisis being facilitated the way it has been and with the numbers being inflated and to, to instill the fear and all of the videos coming out of china that shocked the world and everything you know and then it crippled the the global economic system you know and we knew that this current system was unsustainable and that something was going to have to come and replace that and this was by design and of course it's not going to be the central bankers who take responsibility because they're involved in the in the corrupt system you know they're the ones and the, and the governments aren't going to take responsibility so lo and behold enters the well-timed crisis that will take the fall burn down the current system uh, and then out of the ashes roll out this new economic uh, uh, yeah. system the great reset but it's amazing to see all of the other aspects that are being rushed through uh, how it's going to transform every aspect of our life from education to our finances to health medicine i mean it's it's absolutely unbelievable to see it uh, rolling out because you we've been talking about this for so long it's coming it's coming well it's here it's here and you know uh, mr wood I, I wanted to get your take on solutions. You know, what what can people do to you know even resist locally and identify the problems locally? Do you have any input on that? Well, I sure do. You know, a few years ago, I founded a nonprofit organization called Citizens for Free Speech. It's citizensforfreespeech.org. Surprise! Um, I would encourage people to go there because what we're talking about today in America uh, for the destruction of our constitution. The first thing it has to go is the First Amendment. The First Amendment is all about co uh, communication. It's about talking, it's about discussion, it's about peaceable assembly. It's about asking the government for redress of grievances. It's about freedom of expression of religion and uh, freedom of the press and freedom of what we're doing right now, freedom of speech. Well, <clears throat> the First Amendment is under an obvious attack right now with all this face mask business, social distancing, because of the great panic of 2020. This has nothing to do with the virus at this point. It's bad science all the way. A lot of people have documented that and know it, but it's been politicized, it's been weaponized against the people to create a system of control, a system of uh, submission, if you will, to wear these masks and to break down the will of the people for any further you know, things that they wanna do along the way. I, we know that mandated vaccinations are coming soon too. So when I started CFFS, Originally, it was over the censorship issue with YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and so on. 
we saw those attacks as being very serious, obviously, and they still are. But it's grown to be so much more now, the, the, this issue of the First Amendment. I see a full spectrum attack coming on it from every conceivable direction. And so we, we know that they captivated us on a local basis. That this, this whole United Nations thing has been a mystery to a lot of people. But they have infiltrated every single community in the planet. It's like the crabgrass is in your lawn and it's spread everywhere. They're into Europe, and little towns and bergs and villages. They're into Africa. They're into South America. They're into Central Mexico. They're into Canada. They're in the United States. In every single city and town in America, you'll find sustainable development. This is an economic system. It's not a political system. But they're, they've done it by going local and getting it introduced into local communities. And this is where the, where the battle must be fought. We have been <clears throat> promoting at CFFS a, um, a public movement at this point with our membership. It's just, we're just growing like unbelievable right now what's happening. <clears throat> People are just coming to us by the thousands every, every month, you know, wanting to get involved with this. But basically we're saying to people, get it in your head. We will not comply. That's it. We will not comply. We've been sort of, um, and I've been personally encouraged a little bit that the technocrats have made perhaps a strategic error in making the face mask a symbol of submission. And that's what it's come, that's what it's become. It's a symbol of submission. Not wearing a face mask is not an anti-symbol of submission. It's just you're not wearing a face mask. And that gives every Karen in the world the right to come up and start hollering at you. You selfish bum, you know, you creep, you know, you're, you're hurting everybody's health, that sort of thing. A lot of people know what I'm talking about. So they've had, yeah, maybe experienced that. <clears throat> but we've come up with a system, not, well, not a system. We've come up with a card that we're sending out to people that says we won't wear a face mask, period. We will not comply. And <clears throat> this is just a statement that a lot of people can make totally legitimately Wearing a face mask poses a serious health risk to me, uh, and I won't do it. You know, I, you know, here's the issue. What's wrong with me is none of your business. <laughs> I don't need to tell you what's wrong with me. And people are using these cards around the country to the point where it's becoming a symbol of we will not comply and a symbol, an anti-symbol, if you will, against wearing a face mask. This is what This is one of the greatest opportunities Americans have to do something tangible across not only just the local community, but across the whole nation, because the symbology of it is all these little towns, all these little, all these cities, people everywhere are doing it locally. That's where you have to get access to stores and to you know services and stuff. But they're also doing it nationally to send the message up the food chain. We will not comply. Let them figure that one out. We will not comply with your plans. We will not be socially engineered. We will not be manipulated into, you know, scrambling our mind into making us instruments of fear. Um, we simply not going to play ball with you. I see this as being a great opportunity for us that we haven't seen in 50 years to really get a, enough Americans involved to make a huge national stink and a huge local stink as well well yeah absolutely you know civil disobedience is a very powerful and non-violent uh, uh, tool at our disposal i think this is the most important time of our lives right now uh, as we're in the middle of a major transition taking place uh, that's going to affect everybody i mean i think one good thing that has come out of this whole uh pandemic crisis or you know panic is that it has forced people to kind of become aware of what is taking place because it's now directly affecting their lives. And so they're starting to look around and see what's going on. But uh, Patrick Wood, I just wanted to ask you if you had any final points that you would like to share with us today. Well, I think I just probably would, you know, encourage people to do some reading, to do some research. Um, there's lots of material that's good material. Uh, on the internet, I've got a lot on my website, technocracy.news. And, you know, I would just encourage people to start getting up to speed on what's really going on. I hope they see the bigger picture. At CFFS, for instance, I don't care if somebody understands everything you and I might understand. 
maybe they've just kind of gotten their first glimpse of what, you know, like, I don't like what's going on here. I need to do something. And they don't have a clue yet what's going on. Well, we need to welcome and embrace those people and say, you know what, we, we have answers. We have things that we can help you with. Um, and then maybe some of those, not all, they'll get educated and they'll become, you know, like warriors, if you will, info warriors. Uh, that would be nice. That's not going to be everybody. A lot of people just want to know that they're safe, that they're not scared. And, you know, I talked to a lady up here in, in Mesa not too long ago. She wanted a card and she got my phone number. She called me up. It's a nice lady. I think she said she's 72 years old. She's hiding out. By, and she has a townhouse in a gated community. She's hiding out. She's scared to death to go out, Sparrow. She says, I'm just frightened to death. She says, I have, I forget what it was. She has something wrong with her lungs. She says, I can't wear a mask. I have a dog and I want to, I, I can't, I'm afraid to walk my dog. What if a policeman sees me on the street and you're supposed to wear one up here when you're on the street in Maricopa County? What if a policeman sees me and arrests me? I, I'm afraid to go to the store to get food. W what if they won't let me in? Or what if they just, you know, make me feel so bad? I just can't, you know, and she, she is frozen in fear, locked up behind an iron gate and under kind of a self-imposed house arrest because she is scared to death. This is not the America we want to live in. I, I'm sorry, this is just not the America we want to live in. And there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people across our country that are in the same situation as this lady. Maybe they're going out, but they're scared to death everywhere they go, they're looking over their shoulder. They're scared to death to come into contact with people, look somebody in the eye. This is not the America that we want to have in the future. And I'll tell you, if Americans don't stand up at this point, I fear the whole thing's gonna be down the toilet really soon, really fast. We have an opportunity. We have an opportunity, if we take advantage of it, it might have a really positive outcome. If we don't take advantage of it, I can tell you where the outcome's going. We've said it for 45 years now. You know, these people are going to use their scientific, you know, their engineering, science of social engineering, whatever, and they're gonna, they're gonna trap us into a scientific dictatorship. And, and I have to say, even uh, the author of Brave New World, Aldous Huxley said, there's no good reason ever to escape from scientific dictatorship. He was right. I don't think there is either. If it ever gets their hand, you know, its claws into your flesh, you won't get loose from it. At least in socialism, communism, you know, national socialism, like fascism, at least, in those systems, you had an enemy that you could go physically fight, you know, and we fought wars over that. Um, with the technocracy, you don't know who did anything. You can't get to these people. Who, you get banned from Google, let's say. Hmm. You send in a complaint to Google. You got no right to ban me, to shadow ban my stuff. Where does that go? Who's the person behind it? You don't have a clue. You will never find out. You could take them to the Supreme Court. You'd never find out who that little jerk was that pushed the button to make you disappear. Or maybe there wasn't anybody that pushed the button. Maybe the algorithm was just there and said, Spiro is a bad guy. We don't want him around anymore. And you're gone. This is the essence of scientific dictatorship. Once it gets its claws in you, you can't get them out. So we have an opportunity. The great risk but we have opportunity right now to stand up as Americans, just make the biggest stink they ever saw. And they need to see America saying in unison, we will not comply. We will not comply with you. And we may get to the point even, remember the movie, the classic cult movie now, The Network, where at the end, the end of that movie, the, the newscaster throws up his hands and he throws his throws open the window in his New York, whatever it is, studio, and he says, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. And he said, I want everybody to scream it. And all of a sudden, everybody's leaning out of their window and they're screaming, you know, the same thing. Um, <clears throat> Americans need to really get steamed. Not oh, but steamed and to get active and to get working. And there's just no time to waste. I would agree completely. And uh, yes, the time is now. I mean, we every day we get one step closer, another step closer to not being able to turn back, possibly. So the, the time is now uh, to 
you know, resist this system of control that is coming our way, no doubt about it. And I would like to thank, of course, all of the viewers who do watch and share these reports and these interviews. Please be sure to share this one. And don't forget, I'm going to leave a link for the uh, last video about the mandated vaccines under the emergency declaration in our state, Patrick, uh, that they, you know, they're, they're have authorized the use of mandatory vaccines. They haven't enforced it yet because there's no coronavirus vaccine here yet. But, you know, I want to thank many thanks to my brilliant guest, Patrick Wood. You can find his great work at technocracy.news. Uh, you can also find Patrick Wood on YouTube and on Twitter. I'm going to leave links for all that. I'm not sure if you're on Facebook. I don't go to Facebook, but if you are, I'll leave, be sure to leave a link there as well. A page as well, yeah. Fantastic. And what is the best place for people to go to find your books, Patrick? Well, they can certainly go to my website, technocracy.news, or they can get it off of Amazon. I hate to admit that, but yeah, Amazon has the books. There's a Kindle version. There's an audiobook version of my latest book, and plus the you know the paperback copies are available. Um, the uh, my my original books on the Trilateral Commission are also available uh, in all those places as well. Fantastic, and I'll be sure to leave links for everything below. Patrick Wood, thank you for being my guest today. I look forward to having you on again in the future, and that'll do it for this uh, this episode today. I'm Spiro. Stay tuned for more. Thank you. <laughs>